Our next pre presentation, I may call them Gen X or Gen Y lawyers. So they'll be talking on cross-border transaction disputes and resolution in the U.S. Purpose. Mr. Ruriar Ceres, partner Smith Tramble Russell LLP. Mr. Kevin Murphy, partner Wash and Gearing. Mr. Rishi Bhandari, partner Mandel Bhandari LLP. Where we'll be exploring general corporate and compliance issues in cross-border transactions, the protection of intellectual property rights, the strength of arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism, and the best practices in resolving disputes. Over to you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Right. Good afternoon, folks. Um, first and foremost, I recognize that my panelists and I are actually the, the very last thing that you're going to have to do, deal with and listen to until lunch. So clearly, okay, you know, we're at that point of the day where we need to shake it out a little bit, okay? So hopefully we'll be a bit more sort of a, you know, keep you guys going through to the, the period of lunch, okay, first and foremost. Secondly, I'd like to thank um, Danish, Anjali, and Sagar from Draft and Craft for actually inviting me here, and to thank the Consul General as well from, uh, from India also hosting us. Um, I think it's extremely important that we are here today um, and discussing one of my favorite topics, okay, which is you know, cross-border transactions and international transactions. Um, this particular panel is called Cross-Border Transactions, Disputes and Resolutions, an Indo-US Perspective. I am joined on this particular panel but by two very senior and experienced lawyers, Mr. Kevin Murphy, who is also a partner at Wersch and Goering, LLP in New York, and Mr. Rishi Bandari, a partner at Mandel and Bandari as well, here in New York. Secondly, I'm going to focus my comments, okay, at the macro level when we're talking about parties that are thinking about entering into a business engagement, okay, from a joint venture, from an outright acquisition, purchase and sale agreement, etc. And given the limited time of this particular presentation, I will give a, a general overview okay, of the issues which clients need to consider as they are thinking about moving into a relationship. And what I will do is actually call that particular stage the honeymoon stage. Okay? That's the stage when everyone's happy with each other and wants to get involved in a transaction because we know it's going to be generating capital for us. Then Kevin's going to focus his comments on some of the different legal structures and employment structures. And at that point, I, I consider us to be married, OK? And then Rishi is going to bring it home and discuss things when things go wrong, OK? Litigation, arbitration, etc. And of course, that becomes the divorce. Now, first and foremost, my name is Rudy Ceres. I am a UK trained and qualified lawyer. I've been practicing for almost 30 years now. Um, you know, I'm a solicitor in England as well as in the United States, and I've represented um, you know, businesses, individuals, and governments for a number of years. I'm a partner in the corporate and international group of Smith, Gambrell, and Russell. We are an Atlanta firm, and we've got almost close to 400 lawyers around the world, including London and New York. Sorry, London and, and, uh, and Munich. Now, I also teach an international business transactions course at Fordham Law School, and I didn't realize that she would be here today, but one of my students, okay, Waka Tandinichi, is here as well. Waka's a brilliant lawyer, okay, um, from Japan that also practiced in, uh, in Russia, and uh, she's a wonderful, uh, you know, trade and customs lawyer, and I'd be delighted for all of you to know her as well. Um, now, so let me, let me get into it, okay? Um, first and foremost, we're going to talk about the honeymoon. Now, when folks are in that space where they are looking to do something, they very rarely see any issues, okay? And one would say that you're seeing these issues now through rose-colored specs, okay? Um, we want to get a deal done. We are very excited about what we're going to do next. And this is precisely where 
lawyers like us have to jump in, not because we are going to scupper your deal and make a problem for everyone, okay, which is sometimes the way that folks look at lawyers, but rather it's to provide you with information as the client so that you are making a fully informed decision about going into this transaction. Okay? So the considerations I'm going to discuss are non-exhaustive and clearly depend upon the type of transaction that you are contemplated, the industry as well in which you are working. You know, perhaps that particular industry is a highly regulated one, whether it's finance, whether it's a business critical function. Um, there may be a technical aspect of that particular um, transaction which may require a government um, being involved or some sort of license that you have to have. And so it is extremely important that we consider this from a very, very sort of high level perspective. But let's start with India. Why India? Why is India such a great business partner for the United States uh, companies and vice versa? Because we're talking about not only US companies going and doing business over there, but hopefully Indian companies coming here as well. Now, as of April of this year, India has become the most populous work, uh, nation in the world. And um, so that means you now have a very young and vibrant uh, you know, uh, com country, which according to United Nations data states, and I'm quoting, more than 40% of the country's residents are younger than 25 years old. And the estimated median age in 2023 is apparently 28 years old. So you have a young labor force, relatively low paid, largely English speaking, digitally, digitally literate, if I can say it properly, and also having a reputation for entrepreneurship. All of these things are making India a very big draw for Western companies seeking alternative manufacturing and other business opportunities. It also helps that you have a president, a prime minister, okay, in, in Mr. Modi, who has a bit of star power as well. I mean, I'm not sure if anyone else has a leader of a country that's come to the United Nations and actually done yoga. So I think that there is something about him as an individual that attracts certain issues. Now, from my perspective, okay, going into a transaction, the, one of the most important things that we have to consider is risk. And what is risk? Risk is, is actually the three different things. Legal risk, political risk, and business risk. With legal, how strong and independent is the judiciary? Is one able to actually file legal cases in a particular um, jurisdiction to be able to then get that particular de decision or judgment enforced in that jurisdiction as well? Is, for example, title to land properly recorded and enforced as well? Political issues, political risk. Are free and fair elections things that are usually happening in that particular jurisdiction? Are the opposition parties actually entitled to be involved and participate in that process as well? How stable are the governments? Business risk. How easy is it for you to set up a business in that jurisdiction or potentially partner with a local, men, a local partner there? How are your competitors in that particular space? How is your particular business that you're going to be partnering with in that location or set up in that location, how is business actually executed in that location? Now, the answers to all of those questions, okay, is really going to frame and form what is the next important issue in the conversation, which is due diligence. Due diligence is going to have a number of players, I would say, involved in that process. Again, it's going to depend on the type of deal and obviously the industry, but you're going to look at representatives from upper management, sales, accounting, when you're looking specifically at your target now or your local partner, who are they? What is their reputation? Do they rely on third parties, for example, to close transactions? Do they rely on relationship with government and quasi-government employees to actually secure contracts or retain contracts? As part of that due diligence process, you're going to then start drilling down on more specific questions, okay? And this is where we now have to ask the question, well, you know, how much time and energy does the client actually want to spend on due diligence? 
And you're going to find, of course, like all lawyers in the room, it depends, okay? We're going to have to see what the issues are that the client perceives as being the most important issues that they have to have answered so that they can make that informed decision. One of the important aspects of due diligence, though, that I want to highlight is intellectual property. Intellectual property that you own going into a transaction or the, opposite, the other party owns versus what about intellectual property that's created by the parties as part of the transaction? So IP that is created as a result of the transaction, who owns the IP, who can exploit it? What happens if the parties divorce after the actual transaction is over as well? How do we understand and how do we deal with these types of issues as we're going in? What happens, by the way, if the parties don't execute an agreement and don't move forward with some sort of uh, decision and, uh, and executing a project? Is there actual information in your thought process to protect your client as you've gone in to make sure that if the transaction does not get consummated, that you're actually protecting them coming out again? confidentiality agreements, damages which potentially could arise as a result of breach. So now we've looked at risk, we've thought about due diligence. One of the things I was mentioned earlier on is cultural nuances, okay? When you're looking at international transactions, it's extremely important to consider the cultural nuances that are always going to be there, okay, between parties. Um, sometimes folks describe them as differences, okay? Um, I think that one of the great examples of this is the acquisition and divestment by BMW of the UK car manufacturer Rod um, Rover. Um, that particular case has become a real case study across uh, universities in England on how not to do a particular transaction. Um, one aspect of that from a cultural perspective was the fact that BMW did not really consider the effect on the existing UK workforce on the change of the center of, uni of influence of the, of the company being, which is based in the Midlands, West Midlands, West Midlands of England, now being taken over by a German Bavarian company. And this was particularly given the fact that Rover was more of a British brand and it was the last large car manufacturing business that was leaving ownership of the UK. So there was a real psyche that we had with respect to that particular company. Anyway, moving on, a couple more issues to highlight. Tax, any cross-border transaction which does not have a designated tax person or persons on your team is going to miss a crucial aspect of the continued success or failure of the business going forward. We have to consider tax issues and the implications that they could have, again, irrespective of the type of transaction that you're actually going into. I know, for example, that we have the US and India Tax Income Treaty, the purpose of which is to avoid double taxation, but you have to then go further down into these issues and make sure that we have a tax consultant or partner in relation to law with us. And then one of the final issues that one has to consider when talking about cross-border transactions, particularly involving US or um, US companies or US individuals is the FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Now this particular act addresses two main issues, anti-bribery provisions which prohibit the giving or offering money, gifts or anything of value to a foreign government official to obtain or retain business. The second aspect of the FCPA covers accounting requirements. And these seek to prevent accounting practices which are designed to hide corrupt payments by requiring the companies to maintain accurate books and records and adequate internal accounting controls. Now, this particular act covers US companies U.S. persons and foreign companies that are listed on a U.S. exchange, which is why the Securities and Exchange Commission, together with the Department of Justice, actually administers this particular legislation. Now, I know that folks in the room will say, well, you know, I'm not a U.S. company, I'm not a U.S. person, so why do I care about the FCPA? Well, 
First of all, if you're dealing with any U.S. entity, that U.S. entity has to be cognizant of the practices of the partners they're working with. One. Two, what we're seeing recently is that the U.S. State Department, through the Department of Justice, is being very extraterritorial in its application of the FCPA. And so you're seeing a lot of cases right now where the two parties involved are not U.S. companies, they're not even based in the U.S., but they're still paying because of a sanction that's been imposed on them by the Department of Justice. And so they're still paying fines. And one of the ways that the DOJ is actually you know, utilizing um, you know, this uh, piece of legislation is through the banks and the SWIFT system. So the moment you are doing a transaction, which is always what we're dealing with here, exchange of capital, and you're utilizing a U.S. bank to clear capital or clear uh, certain transactions, you are going to subject yourself to potential issues with the FCPA. <coughs> One of the really important aspects of this, of course, is the fact that individual executives can have criminal liability for the things that they do with respect to their company. Now, the final thing, and I think this was mentioned a couple of times as well, partnerships are everything. For me, specifically, being able to partner with local Indian law firms, business owners, accountants, financiers, etc., is going to allow me to provide my clients with more information, which is going to allow them to make better decisions about how they're moving forward with a particular transaction. I've been able to actually work with Indian lawyers and accountants for the past 10 years or so, and so for me, having a conference like this just moves the needle forward again because I think more and more people are now understanding the opportunity that actually is India. And so I look forward to meeting all of you and um, you know, seeing how we can develop a relationship going forward successfully. And with that, I'm now going to pass it over to Kevin, who is going to deal with the issue of being married. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rudy. That was an excellent presentation. I want to thank the, uh, the consulate uh, for having me. It's my first time here, and what a venue. What an incredible venue to be able to speak. I want to thank uh, Mr. Sharma for inviting me from Draft and Craft, and it's been uh, a, a delight. I have to also thank the country of India, because the country of India actually changed my life and my practice. I started off uh, 30 years ago in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office as an intern in a, a, a group called the Special Investigation Bureau, where my international practice was focused on listening to wiretaps of Colombian drug lords sending cocaine and heroin into the United States. That was my international practice, right? And I was there for four years. And over time, I became interested in pharmaceutical practice, particularly uh, with respect to product liability, as well as um, with respect to uh, patent challenges. And so I began uh, the litigating cases on behalf of Indian companies and had the, the, uh, the pleasure of addressing the Indian Pharmaceutical Association in Mumbai in 2009. Since then, I've gone to India almost every year, apart from the pandemic, and uh, uh, represent um, Indian clients. And it's been my privilege to do so. So thank you, India, for taking my life uh, from uh, the death and destruction uh, of uh, illegal drugs and into life-saving drug treatments. So I appreciate that very much. Um, so what I've done here is I, I think I've, uh, it's mentioned in the materials that I'm a litigator, but I also give uh, pre-litigation advice to Indian companies. And uh, Indian companies are now coming to the United States and setting up operations in the United States. Many regulatory uh, regimes uh, require this. The FDA, for example, won't allow for uh, a, non a new drug application to be filed unless the Indian company has uh, operations in the United States and can be held accountable in the United States. And the clicker doesn't work. Uh, George, can I get the next slide, please? Oh, okay, great. So, so there are multiple vehicles that are potential uh, vehicles to consider for an Indian uh, company coming to the United States to open up operations. Uh, a joint venture is a, is a typical way of doing it. Generally speaking, a joint venture is where two companies 
merge interests with a particular area. There's a joint venture uh, agreement, usually a memorandum of understanding first, where the agreements are, are laid out. This gives the advantage to the Indian company of benefiting from a company's experience in a particular area and to avoid uh, unforeseen issues. There's an established business. The fundamentals are observable. You can sit down and over the course of what takes usually months, going back and forth with each other's businesses and refining the purpose for the joint venture. You know your own company, you know what your own company can offer. That's established in the documents. They know what the market is and how to best leverage your company. Uh, the issues are, however, in those months-long discussions about identifying the boundaries between the two companies. Which company is responsible for this? Which company is responsible for that? How much capital is going to be invested in the particular, in the particular operation? What happens when it goes wrong? Uh, there are shared risks in joint ventures, uh, and so, you know, the entire operation could be uh, gummed up in litigation, which sometimes happens. Generally speaking, it's important to look where you leap spend your time with due diligence and uh, an extensive amount of time. Can I get the next slide? Great. Another uh, entity that's possible, and this is a typical one for smaller enterprises, is the limited liability company. This uh, company, in a, other, you know, different from uh, standard corporations, is uh, governed by managers. These managers can also be owners on occasion, but it's usually one person, and this allows the business to expand, allows for sort of limited capital. It, it's taxed as a partnership by default, but there is an IRS election that you can make uh, to what's called checking the box, and it can be taxed as a corporation. Otherwise, it's listed on the manager's personal uh, taxes. Generally, the interest is not in shares, but in membership interests. And one nice thing about this is a corporation is generally distributed across a class of shares. Uh, but you can have a waterfall provision in an LLC, which allows for the member uh, who is most responsible for management to take a greater proportion of any distribution. The key thing here is to identify what the governance is, and generally speaking, this is done in corporations through articles of a corporation, but it's called the operating agreement in the scope of uh, limited liability companies, and that is the be all and end all, I can tell you, that I'm in a litigation now involving an Ohio limited liability company, and we are exchanging summary judgment documents now. Every one of our submissions has an argument about the operating agreement, its scope, whether it was abided by, et cetera. George, can I get the next slide? The corporation uh, vehicles that you can choose from are between C and S. C corporations are the standard and would be of most interest to Indian companies, particularly if, if there's an Indian investor, because the smaller, the S corporation, has to have all owners, individuals, and all owners as residents in the United States, and that not, may not be the case for you if you're of uh, Indian citizenship. You won't be allowed to be a manager, uh, or I'm sorry, to, uh, to allow this pass-through effect. A C corporation, is taxed at uh, the personal level for those people who accept distributions and taxed at the corporate level for its profits. The S corporation, like the LLC, allows the tax to pass down directly to the individual, and so there's no level of corporate taxation. Oh, it's actually working now, yay. Okay, <laughs> okay. this is an area of uh, particular interest when you're starting up a business. The employment rules in the United States, there are 50 different sets of rules <laughs> for each of the 50 states. There are uh, a lot of differences, and you have to do your research and you have to do your homework. Finding local counsel in where you're gonna set up is important, unless, of course, you've got uh, uh, a Delaware corporation, it might be adopted by Delaware rules, but with your operations in a, in a given state, you're gonna be governed by those rules as well. The typical relationship in the United States is an at-will relationship. That means when a party enters in, into employment or is an employer, um, the parties can terminate that at any time. It's customary for an employee to give two weeks notice to allow an employer to fill in the gap, but that is not uh, really enforceable. Uh, I don't believe in any state. Um, the at-will uh, provisions allow for bo both parties to simply walk away. 
the longer an employee stays, the, the more you want to preserve the loyalty of your current other employees. So you want to enter into severance agreements typically, and you want to establish a precedent for those severance agreements for any of those uh, individuals who are working for the company for multiple numbers of years. There are wage and hour uh, concerns in each of the states. Uh, the, this is the, uh, the federal standard, the Fair Labor Standards Act, but wage and hour limitations go state by state as well. So both the federal and the state provisions have to be followed. The minimum wage in this country, sadly, is $7.25 an hour, which is an absurdly low rate for living, for example, in New York City, uh, but states vary considerably. So. Uh, the, the rate is much higher in New York. It's uh, $14.25, I believe, outside of New York City. It's $15 an hour in New York City. The overtime uh, rate is uh, a rate that is payable after 40 hours of work within a given work week, and it's payable at one and a half, uh, one and a half times whatever the hourly rate the employee is taking. There are also record-keeping requirements. You have to put uh, the rights of the employee in uh, a break room, um, and time and pay records have to be maintained. There's a great deal of discussion about this. Most companies will keep uh, records uh, for seven years. Some will keep records for 10 years, 15 years. And so there's a serious issue of uh, moving data to the cloud for a larger corporation. As, you, as a smaller corporation, an Indian corporation setting up in the United States, for example, in the, in the middle market level, you know, seven years is generally what people are accepting these days. Uh, there are certain uh, employees that are exempt from this. Those are in the professional areas, engineers, lawyers, and physicians. Each state and the federal government uh, has anti-discrimination laws. And in general, I think it was mentioned uh, earlier uh, in the discussion uh, by Mr. Rosenbaum, that uh, we started off with a regime that allowed for uh, the civil rights protections of, of the 1964 Act. Uh, which protected race, national origin, sex, etc. Those have been added to. The major addition was in the 90s with, when disability was added as a protected class. And now uh, sexual orientation have been added, age and genetic information. A protected class means that uh, if an employee is terminated and they claim that they are uh, being discriminated against uh, or e even with respect to terms and conditions of employment. They can claim that, uh, the discrimi that uh, discrimination was the reason for the termination or the adverse effect on them. And so uh, then, then the, um, the burden then shifts to the employer to demonstrate that, it's, that the termination was for a business purpose and a non-discriminatory purpose. There is a tremendous amount of litigation on protected classes in the United States. The United States, I think, has come a long way since 1964, but it still has a long way to go. Particularly in the area of sex and sexual orientation, the Me Too movement, which many of you are probably familiar with, is only, uh, was only launched a few years ago and under, uh, showed the under underbelly of many of the industries in the United States with respect to sex discrimination. This, I think I spend, with respect to my employment practice, I spend about 60% of my time on these issues. Um, when you set up a, a corporation, you have to be focused on uh, vacation and family leave issues. No federal or state law uh, requires paid vacation days, but this is pretty common. Uh, generally, there are certain uh, accepted holidays, Martin Luther King Day, for example, July 4th, Christmas Day, etc. cetera. Um, there is a Family Medical Leave Act that was passed during the Clinton administration in the 90s. It allows for uh, the employee to demand unpaid leave for certain conditions, the birth or adoption of a child. Most U.S. companies, and I would suggest Indian companies that set up in the United States, should also be uh, paying for leave for maternity leave and paternity leave. This is a, uh, a typical uh, allowance for employees, particularly if you want them to stay. There's a serious problem holding on to people in the United States now, so uh, that's at least, I think, a bare minimum. Um, also covers serious health conditions of that of family members, military-related issues, 
And some states, uh, though this isn't required on the federal level, are require you to actually pay a portion of that time. The, the real issue that comes up is after the leave is over, what happens when the employee comes back? The employee is supposed to be given a reasonably acceptable, depending on the circumstances, uh, position with the same amount of responsibility and pay, if it's available. In India, I know there is a practice of having uh, handbooks which, which uh, uh, require rules of conduct that is allowed in the United States as well. Highly encouraged if you want to maintain the similar corporate culture in the United States as you have in India, that's available to you. These handbooks are, are drafted, they're vetted carefully by the lawyers, and they're provided to employees as, as part of the onboarding. So they sign uh, on the dotted line that they've, they've read it and understood it and will abide by it. They should be uh, carefully and consistently enforced. Discriminatory enforcement, obviously, of the handbooks uh, against some will run into the protected class areas that we, we talked about before. So I spend a small amount of time in, of my practice in, the, in these handbooks, but uh, they, they typically come up in the, in the course of whether or not the employee was terminated appropriately. Employee compensation is a major issue. I urge um, uh, any company to hire a third party uh, professional group such as, such as ADP for its compensation. They know what the rules are. They're very careful. They cover all 50 states. It's well worth the investment. I think most of my clients are ADP uh, users. Um, the US requires payroll generally, it, well, it's not required, but it uh, generally occurs twice a month. Um, and the employer must pay uh, Social Security and Medicare tax as part of uh, any onboarding of an employee. Uh, this uh, health benefits is a major issue in the United States, particularly with the passage of uh, the ACA under the Obama administration, Obamacare. It requires uh, employers with 50 plus employees to provide health insurance. Uh, finally, confidential information. I, I, I happen to do a lot of uh, intellectual property litigation and uh, confidential information is the, uh, a major area, a major sore spot. Um, companies need to protect their confidential information by establishing um, a, a way of restricting access to the most important trade secrets uh, or proprietary or other confidential information of the company to the employees that need to know. And that needs to be carefully enforced. The best way to do that is during the onboarding to create a non-disclosure agreement. These are, I know, uh, typical in India because I've uh, been asked when I represent Indian clients to sign those non-disclosure agreements myself, uh, though the, the legal rules cover uh, lawyers for confidentiality, but, so I'm happy uh, to do that. Okay, that's where I'm gonna leave it. I tended to speed dial through these slides because I know we're getting a little long in the day and we're right before lunch. Uh, but now we'll hear what happens when uh, things, go, things go sour. Hello, I'm Rishi Bhandari and I am a litigator uh, like Kevin is as well, but I get to talk about the the part of litigation that I enjoy is when things go wrong. All that stuff I, that you have to do to stop things from going wrong is way too much pressure for me. The idea that I'd have to give advice, uh, which would then make it so that you wouldn't end up in court, um, you know, that's a heavy, heavy burden. I only get involved when things are wrong. A lot of times I get hired just a few months before a trial or an arbitration. When we come in and we'll do the arbitration or the trial, if it's a jury trial or a bench trial, uh, and so this summer I have two trials coming up, one which is a bench trial starting on July 10th, and then the next is a jury trial coming up on August 7th. Um, I typically uh, will do arbitrations, and I've been to India, and I've spoken to uh, some firms over there about what to expect in litigation in the United States. So um, that's basically what I'm gonna talk about today is cross-border arbitration. I think the first presentation this morning did a really great job kind of laying out why arbitration is so important 
it when American companies and Indian companies are doing business together. Because by setting up arbitra by having cross-border arbitration, you're able to figure out a set of rules that everyone can abide by. Uh, I'll talk very briefly about enforcing an arbitration award here in the United States and also in India. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the American discovery process, which is what a lot of people associate with uh, litigation in the United States. Uh, if they're not focused on the stuff you see in TV and movies. And then finally, uh, very briefly, I'll just talk a little bit about the best way to respond to a lawsuit if a client of yours or company you're associated with ever has to deal with that. Oh, there we go, cross-border arbitration. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I've taken a couple of cartoons which I'm using to illustrate points better than I could ever say them. And this is uh, maybe not easy to see all the way in the back, but it's Snow White and the Wicked Witch submitting uh, a, the fairness question for a binding arbitration. Literally anything can be submitted for arbitration. And I think that's one of the features that makes it so desirable when companies from different countries are doing business together. They can agree upon what country's rules are going to apply. It could either be the United States rules, it could be India's rules, it could be a third uh, party set of rules which are put forth by the different arbitration uh, um, uh, tribunals themselves. Uh, and so this is a very common way for companies that aren't in the same location to try and set forth some sort of governing document and some basis for being able to do business together that everyone understands. There are many different arbitration tribunals. If you were doing just litigation here in the United States, typically you would do it with JAMS, the Judicial Arbitration and Mediation Service, or the AAA, uh, the American Arbitration Association. They're probably the two biggest here in the United States. But by far the biggest in, in cross-border disputes, it's not really not even close. I think they have about two-thirds of the total uh, international arbitrations is the ICC. And the International Chamber of Commerce uh, has arbitrations you know, which take place all over the world. They have rules that are very robust and are designed to allow people from different countries to be able to feel that they're getting a fair hearing. Um, all of the, the different arbitration organizations that exist have different fee structures. So if you're setting up a company, uh, one of the things that, or if you're setting up a deal and you're having a joint venture with an Indian company, one of the things you're going to want to figure out, and this is very common in the pharmaceutical industry where you'll have a company that's developing the drugs, company that's producing the drugs, and company that's uh, marketing the drugs, the agreement that those companies have when they're putting it together uh, could be based on any of these rules or it could be based on just a country's uh, choice of law. Uh, some, one difference between all these is the way that they charge. The ICC charges basically their fee is a uh, percentage of the total amount that's demanded. Uh, and so those fees can be very, very sizable arbitration fees if you're going with the ICC. Whereas if you go with the uh, International Center for Dispute Resolution, the AAA, or if you went with a JAMS, they've got a different fee structure, which could be flat fees based on the size of certain cases, rather than a percentage of the amount that's demanded. Uh, so that's something to bear in mind if you are setting up uh, an agreement. In terms of locations, uh, I thought that first presentation this morning was fantastic. It really indicated that India is making a push to try and become a very desirable arbitration location. It hasn't been thus far for probably reasons that were articulated before. Uh, specifically, if you can't have lawyers from other countries practicing international arbitration over there, it's very difficult to imagine that an American company or a European company is going to be comfortable. So things might change. But for now, the three uh, top venues in terms of international arbitration, the locations where they occur, are London, Singapore, and here in New York. This is the number thir three location for international arbitrations. And in fact, a lot of the arbitrations I've handled that have been international arbitrations involve an American company and a foreign company, including uh, companies in Korea and in India, uh, and they choose New York to be the location. And that's one of the reasons for picking one of these robust uh, arbitration centers is you have a very large group of arbitrators you'll be able to select from. Uh, and there's a lot of questions about how specifically you're going to choose the arbitrators. Uh, one common way is to just simply allow the arbitration tribunal to present lists of arbitrators to you, which are going to be the judges in the case. 
another one is where each side selects a, an arbitrator themselves and then that those two arbitrators will select a cert third one. Uh, and so these are other considerations that you'll uh, bear in mind if you're deciding to ha enter into an agreement related to arbitration. In terms of enforcement of an arbitration award, so I'm going to skip ahead. I'm going to say you just won your arbitration. It's great. You're so happy. You got an award from the arbitration tribunal for $100 million. And now uh, that piece of paper, unfortunately, can't be sold on eBay or has no value in and of itself. You got to enforce the arbitration award. Well, the good news is most countries in the world, most countries in the world are signatories to this convention, this treaty that was set up in 1958 called the New York Convention. Um, and the New York Convention basically makes it very, very easy to enforce an arbitration award that is where the award is issued in one of the signatory countries and then it has to be transported to a place like the United States or to India. Both India and the United States as well as all of these countries uh, that are darkened on this map are signatories to the 1958 New York Convention. So that means that it's very easy to enforce an arbitration award. There's very limited grounds for which an ar by wh under which an arbitration award cannot be enforced. So just very briefly, this is definitely the worst slide I have here. <laughs> Violates every rule of PowerPoint. You're supposed to not have this many words on it. But uh, uh, I, just so that I can explain it to you real quickly, these are the grounds under which Article 5 allows for an arbitration award to not be enforced in a particular country. Essentially, if there was some incapacity of one of the parties, like they were unable to attend or unable to defend themselves for some reason, or they were a child, um, if the arbitration agreement itself was invalid, the procedure was procedurally unfair in some very substantial way, usually that amounts to fraud or something along those lines. Um, the award awards something that's not part of the arbitration award itself. Uh, and then the actual setup of the arbitration the tribunal is not is set up in accordance with the agreement of the parties, or it's just not a final award or the award was set aside in the country where it took place. So what you'll notice is not here, and that's the reason why I made this terrible slide. I couldn't figure out the right way to do this. What's not here is under no circumstances can you relitigate the merits of your arbitration. So no matter how unfair it is, no matter how terrible the arbitration award is, no matter how badly the arbitrators got it wrong, that is not a basis for being able to stop the enforcement in either the United States or in India. And that's extremely powerful. I will say I've had cases where there have been a, you know, a $50 million arbitration award against a party that essentially defaulted on it because they thought it was a $5 million claim and they were going to go bankrupt one way or the other and it didn't, it didn't matter. Uh, and then the arbitration award gets enforced in another country, so it's a $50 million arbitration award, and then they start trying to go after the uh, other entities that they say, you know, uh, had alter ego liability. So it is extremely important to make sure that if there's an arbitration that it's affecting any affiliated company, of people who are affiliated with your company, uh, that is uh, defended on the merits as best possible during the arbitration itself, because you can't set it aside for any merits-based reason. Um, <clears throat> One benefit of arbitration is that you don't have to go through the full American discovery process. That being said, the parties can agree to whatever rules they want. And so one of the things that happens a lot of times is that there'll be some, some discovery process. <laughs> if you just press it hard enough, it works. <laughs> um, some portion of discovery that uh, occurs in arbitrations is very similar to what happens in American uh, discovery sometimes. Other times you'll have situations like, uh, for example, even FINRA, which is the Financial Institution Regulatory Authority, they don't allow for all of these types of discovery because the rules of that arbitration organization have a much more streamlined approach. For example, they don't allow depositions unless you can establish very clearly good cause for them. Um, but these discovery tools are the ones that make it both 
desirable to be in American court sometimes because this will allow you to get the information you need in order to either defend yourself or, or more typically if you're the plaintiff in a case to be able to prosecute your case. Um, and then there are also the sorts of things that tend to be expensive and so people don't want to have a lot of uh, discovery in some instances and especially when you've got sophisticated companies on both sides of a transaction or a deal they will choose to opt out of some of these things. Um, depositions. All right. Harder. <laughs> uh, as, an actu as a litigator myself, I do find that this dis these discovery uh, processes are very helpful. And so I would say having some amount of discovery involved in whatever your dispute is. At the time that you're entering into an agreement, you might think you don't want any discovery at all. But actually, depositions uh, can be our situation where the parties are under oath. They have to actually answer your questions. And uh, they have to make sure you know, that the answers that they give can be used in the arbitration or they can be used in a litigation. I find that depositions often are the part of the litigation process when a case is most likely to settle. If it doesn't settle right away, uh, after some depositions have taken place and people have given their sworn testimony, it actually becomes a time when a case settles. So in some ways, having depositions and having discovery, forcing the parties to contend with that stuff before the hearing itself can save money. This is, um, you, you know, a, a cartoon that says, uh, you know, where the, it's a couple in a restaurant and the, I assume one of them, <laughs> don't know which one, one of them is saying to the other one, you're always telling me how much you love me. But just once, I'd like to hear you say it the way you said it in your deposition. <laughs> and I just think, what good coaching that person must have had <laughs> preparing for that deposition. Um, and that brings me to uh, the last topic here, which is how to respond to a lawsuit. Now, a lot of times, uh, you'll be uh, representing a company or you'll be involved with a company that gets sued. And here's just a very short Here's a very short uh, list of things that I think are important just to bear in mind. Obviously, you're going to want to speak to a lawyer because what I've always thought about litigation and what I think to this day, I've been doing it for a little bit over 20, 20 years now, uh, is whoever figures out what's important first typically gets the much better result, wins the litigation because they know what they're looking for in discovery. They know what statements they should be making and what statements they have to be careful about making. Figuring out what's important first in a litigation is critically, critically important. And so you want to try and engage counsel immediately. You want to prepare an answer or a motion to dismiss potentially. You definitely don't want to default, which is to say this is such a dumb case, we're not even going to answer it. Because when that happens, especially in arbitrations, but even if you get a judgment in a jurisdiction you're not familiar with, they can be very easily enforced in other countries. And you've got to make sure to preserve evidence. So I'm going to tell a little story about preserving evidence, which is not, strictly speaking, uh, you know, a, uh, only about preserving evidence. But to give you some background, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about copyright in the United States. So, Everybody who creates any work here in the United States gets automatic copyright protection as soon as that work is preserved in some sort of medium, such as a writing or a video or sound recording of some sort. But people are allowed to use copyrighted materials if it satisfies the fair use test. There's a famous case in front of the Supreme Court just a few weeks ago uh, where it was a uh, photographer named Lynn Goldsmith who sued the Andy Warhol Foundation. And the Supreme Court found that the Andy Warhol uh, 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 artwork was not fair use. But these are the, uh, this is the way to figure out whether or not something is fair use. And there's no set standard for it. But there was a really famous case about, 10, about 15 years ago now involving this photo. Uh, or this poster. Some of you might be familiar with this one. So when Obama ran for president for the first time in 2008, this was one of this is probably the most iconic piece of art that his campaign had. It was the Hope poster, created by a artist named Shepard Ferry. Now the Hope poster was based on a photograph uh, uh, that was taken, and I'm going to show you what. 
photograph was. This is the photograph that it was based on. It was by a photographer from the Associated Press named Manny Garcia. And this is all the different stuff that Shepard Ferry apparently did to that photo when he was creating the Hope photo. You know, he rotated the image, he redrew the shoulder, he obviously added color to it, uh, straightened the left collar. The one part, number five, is the one that I think Obama might take the most issue with. <laughs> Redrawing the outlines of his ear to appear to make them look more perfectly shaped and smooth. But he did a lot of things. And he obviously created something that most people would probably say is transformative. And it was a really, really great fair use case. The Associated Pet Press and Shepard Ferry uh, entered into litigation. Uh, I think Shepard Ferry sued them first here in New York, seeking a declaratory judgment saying, this poster is fair use. It's transformative of that photograph from the Associated Press. And he was represented by the Stanford Fair Use Project uh, and the Associated Press obviously had very good lawyers also. But what Shepard Ferry did is he destroyed a lot of the evidence showing how he made that photo. Instead, he claimed that it came from this photo. Because what Shepard Ferry thought was if he used only a portion of the photo, as opposed to the majority, the vast majority of the photo, it would be more likely to be considered fair use. So, for, so what he did not preserve the evidence that he should have preserved. And in fact, he destroyed some of the evidence. And it only came to light when one of his employees was on his computer and said he found stuff indicating that it was a different photo. And then he came public. He ended up having to settle with the Associated Press in a case that he probably should have won. And he actually had criminal charges pressed against him where he had to plead guilty a few years later to tampering with evidence. So this is all to show this is something that's very common when companies have litigation. They think it's either stupid, they think it's dumb, they think that there's an easy way to get from point A to point B, and there's a real temptation to you know, try and take shortcuts sometimes. And I think that's one of the very important reasons, you know, with clients that I've worked with in the United States, and especially in other countries, to be perfectly honest, uh, to, to work with them very early on to make sure that they don't shoot themselves in the foot by taking actions that will cause them to lose for procedural reasons what they really can defend or can push forward very effectively on substantive reasons. So with all that said, thank you very much for uh, your attention and let's have some lunch. Oh, wait, no, we got any questions. All right, uh, I'll sit back down and then I guess if you have questions for any of us, you can ask us and we'll do our best and then we'll go for lunch very quickly. You have to wait for the lunch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So with that, I would like to call upon Mr. Rakesh Sharma, Chairman Legal for SEPC, to distribute the memento. Kevin Murphy, yeah. yeah. Mr. Rudy.